environmental ethics and humanities. And it's our pleasure to bring you these weekly programs, 10 in the fall and 10 in the spring. Our program today, Pushing the Interprofessional Education Envelope, is the School of Nursing's Vice Memorial Lecture, presented annually in memory of beloved professor and nursing school leader, Sula Mae Baker Weiss. The Weiss Lecture is offered as a medical center hour, and thus might be considered one of the foundations for interprofessional nursing and medical education here at UVA. For really, in every medical center hour where nurses and physicians and chaplains and other professionals are present together, listening together and sharing their views with one another, interprofessional learning is going on. Interprofessional education has been addressed in some recent vice lectures and robust interprofessional education projects now involve both UVA's nursing and medical schools. Some projects, like the two-year-old Heart of Medicine project about care at the end of life, are student-initiated and entirely student-run. The bottom line seems to be that it matters that those who practice together also learn together. But what do we mean by that? What does it mean for UVA schools of nursing and medicine that we commit ourselves to interprofessional education? What's the impact, individually on learners and institutionally, on how we're organized and how we care for patients? And what if this university were to push the envelope, seek to lead nationally in this effort? What's in it for our students, our health systems, and the patients and families we serve? Let me welcome now UVA Dean of Nursing, Dory Fontaine, who will introduce to you the 2014-2015 Vice Lecturer, Dr. Linda Cornerlet from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, who will lead us in a consideration of pushing the interprofessional education envelope. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. Dr. Childress has been such a treasure here for us in how we unite medical students and nursing students, and um, I'm always thrilled to work with you. So it's my pleasure to welcome you all, packed crowd, to this year's Vice Lecture. It's an annual celebration of excellence in nursing education, practice, and leadership, concepts that were modeled in the marvelous service of former nursing dean, Zula Mae Baber Weiss, for whom it is named. So our speaker today is one of us, a seasoned, compassionate nurse who knows a great deal about concepts we at the School of Nursing and, the, and our health system and School of Medicine hold near and dear. Quality and safety, interprofessional education and practice, and the role all of us play in cultivating a collaborative and safe culture. Dr. Linda Cronenwet is Dean Emeritus at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill School of Nursing, and we might forgive you about that Tar Heel win on Saturday. I don't know if we're ready yet. Um, she's also the co-director of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Executive Nurse Fellows Program and has spent a long and distinguished career practicing, teaching, and researching how to empower nurses individually and together, collectively. She studies how to establish safety cultures, build high reliability processes, how to learn more and boost quality in the system, and work for which she has repeatedly received accolades. In 2012, she completed a seven-year journey as the PI of a national initiative called Quality and Safety Education for Nurses, or you might have seen it as QCEN. It's an effort funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Her work as a board member of the Josiah Macy Foundation, this is the entity that so generously funds UVA nursing's own interprofessional education initiatives here in the schools of nursing and medicine, has been very impactful, as has her work as a board member of the North Carolina Institute of Medicine and her contributions as chair of the North Carolina Quality Center. She co-chaired the IOM Committee on Identifying and Preventing Medication Errors and served as a board member of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and the North Carolina Institute of Medicine. And she began her work in the hospital corridors as a nurse and administrator at the wonderful Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. She earned her undergraduate and doctoral degrees from the University of Michigan, her master's degree in parent-child from the University of Washington. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing, of the National Academies of Practice, and the North Carolina Institute of Medicine. 
past president of New Hampshire Nurses Association, past chair of American Nurses Association Congress of Nursing Practice, and a past secretary of the Academy of Nursing. So we are thrilled to have you with us today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Linda Clay. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I've uh, admired you all my life. My niece is a proud graduate of this institution, and you're just three hours off the road, and I've never been here, so this is a real thrill for me. Um, so today, in a brief period, we're talking about interprofessional education, and um, as Dora mentioned, I have come to this through the quality and safety work that I've done and through my board membership of the Macy Foundation. And I, I think there are a lot of students in the audience, and I'm for actually primarily going to be addressing your faculties uh, in the schools of medicine, nursing, pharmacy, and all the wonderful schools that you have here on this campus. But to just, and you've had many other lectures on this topic, so I'm not going to go through the history or any of all of those things, but to talk with you a little bit, just to say we do have some sort of logic model about why we would be interested in interprofessional education. Most of our life, my life, we have educated people in total silos within the professions, proudly claiming the autonomy of each group to do their own thing, not working together, even though we will work together the rest of our lives. In fact, when I was leaving Houston, we discovered that almost all schools of nursing graduated nurses who never had a meaningful conversation with a physician, the persons that they will work with hand and glove from the day they leave. The same is true of medical students, whom I oriented to Dartmouth-Hitchcock medical students for, four, for um, to the, our medical center for 14 years, had no idea how nurses were educated, what the differences were, what they did, and whatever. So this, this is why we think it's important to address that problem. We have enough evidence out there that the teamwork and collaboration issues are uh, uh, resulting in medical errors to a much higher degree than it's at all ethically feasible, and we have to do something about that as the aviation industries and the nuclear industries have been done before us. So we think that interprofessional education and working on these team-based competencies will move into practice and result in high-functioning teams that would include patients and families and members of those teams, that would result in patient-centered and coordinated team-based care if we prepared ourselves differently, and that eventually it would result in safer, more reliable, more effective, more efficient healthcare systems, better patient satisfaction, and more importantly, equally importantly, more professional joy in work. We know in the nursing literature that one of the major, major sources of nursing satisfaction in workplaces is the quality of the physician-nurse interaction. So it, the joy in work is a significant part of that as well. I want to just acknowledge, uh, and this is like bringing coals to Newcastle because you are doing so much here in, in the professional education, but this work which has come out about the competencies that we all should have has been a major foundation for the thinking about what we should do, that every student should learn these things, and that we should be able to move forward on that basis. And if we all have to learn these things, the idea is why not learn them together? So the important factors in enacting successful IPE, we had a, a meeting of experts, yours included, um, and they listed these issues as being important. Having leadership at the top, having faculty attention, and their own development. In fact, many faculties have never taught in any interprofessional capacity. In fact, faculties have sometimes taught in ways that uh, it caused interprofessional strife. And in nursing, as well as medicine, as well as other professions, we have not always been collaborative in our approaches to how we would teach about working with others. Careful, thoughtful, interprofessional planning and rigor that includes everyone who's a part of it. The idea that it would not be viewed as a single event, but a regularly occurring thing that happens throughout your curriculum. That we might use technology as an aid uh, to do that, whether that's through simulation, high fidelity, low fidelity, uh, case studies uh, uh, on, on internet, etc. 
that there would be simultaneous work and learning across education and practice, that you, we go into practice settings where all of us are there, medical students, pharmacy students, nursing students, and yet how much interaction across those students happens? Almost none. And that there would be humility about what we don't know yet, and there are a lot of things that we don't know yet. So as we push the envelope, we're pushing it in ways that we don't know the answers to. Another recent national IPE initiative was this uh, IOM report that came out on learning how to improve health from interprofessional <coughs> models across the continuum of education to practice. And I just want to highlight a couple thoughts for consideration that came out of that report. <clears throat> One is recognizing how much money we're spending duplicating the teaching in each school and how much might be saved if we could do some of those things in one place. Not to speak of that we would also achieve some interprofessional learning at the same time. And the second being recognizing the costs of retraining new graduates of all the professions when we don't develop those quality and safety competencies that are related to interprofessional <laughs> education while they're part of, of, of their programs. At Dartmouth, we had a high uh, rate of training our staff in quality improvement techniques, but every year we would get a new generation of medical students and nursing students and pharmacy students who've never had that in their programs. And again, this is something they can get, and they can get it all together because the science is the same for all of us. Recognize the, the implications of extracurricular versus required learning. If something is extracurricular for you, it's wonderful, and it's wonderful that you have students who are generating interprofessional opportunities around end of life care or whatever. But if it's not required, what does that say about the future? That it really isn't necessary that we work well in teams? It really isn't necessary that we collaborate well? It really isn't necessary that we understand each other's roles? It's, there's some method we have to get it into the required curriculum, or it speaks to being something that's uh, not really that important. And then recognizing the importance of aligning educational activities with real life work and challenges. If it's not aligned, you all very quickly will come to realize it's not important, right? If you don't see it in your practice, if you don't see it in your clinicals, if you don't see it in the hidden curriculum that goes on where you're working when you graduate, then it also will not achieve long impact and it will not, the value to learners will go away. We had, um, uh, in our CUSA work, one of the faculty had, was teaching the SBAR, I don't know if you do that here, the SBAR Communications for Nurses and Physicians, and um, she followed up those graduates in there where they had gone to work and found that where SBAR was used in the clinical setting where, where they went to work, everyone continued using it. It was wonderful. Where it wasn't used there, they stopped. So we have to get this aligned in the practice setting as well as in the, in the educational component to make it work. So the theories, we don't really know for sure what's important. One theory is that if health profession students learn in common before they are enrolled, They'll learn to mutually respect each other and have professional values that are fundamental to future collaborative practice. Um, we don't know for sure if that theory is true. Um, if so, does being in the same room like this and not speaking to each other, is that sufficient? <laughs> um, there are times and there are some studies in the literature that bringing people together can force stereotypes to be uh, exaggerated rather than dispelled. And do you have to be interprofessional in the faculty, too? We don't know. And yet we do believe, and um, the leading thinkers in IPE believe, that there does need to be some learning together, so that there's some sense that people know what the other professions are learning and knowing. Another theory is that if students learn more about each other's roles, they'll be better prepared for patient-centered, team-based cares. So the questions we have as we push that envelope are, which roles do they have to learn about? Are students good informants about those roles? Um, actually, as dean, 
uh, I would always be very interested in what the students had to say about our IPE activities. And more frequently than not, I would have nursing students say to me, you know, I, I can't really learn anything from a medical student. I want to learn from a real doctor. And likewise, <laughs> when I was at Dartmouth, we had medical students who wanted to learn from real nurses, not other students. So it's a very interesting issue about when you can learn about interprofessional teamwork and collaboration, but you're learning it with a professional from the other field as opposed to a student from the other field. And probably a mixture of that's required. And the big question we have is what happens when professions disagree about the roles? Because that makes one of the hardest things uh, some leading medical students in the country were wanting to interview a group of us and said, what's the biggest barrier to interprofessional education at the nurse practitioner primary care uh, interface? And I said, uh, because we haven't yet organ in organized medicine, organized nursing, settled the roles people are playing. It's very hard to teach good teamwork if you can't say what the roles are. So that's a barrier to this piece. If students experience interprofessional team training, they will be collaborative practice ready for their roles. And that implies that we're focusing on the system level quality, teamwork, patient centeredness, and safety competencies for them to be collaborative practice ready. That is potentially learning ethics in a room together might get you there, but probably not. We'll you probably have to do something that takes you out of your individual role where we're teaching you how to be a good physician, a good pharmacist, a good nurse, and we'll have you look at that system of care and how it's functioning together and how reliable it is and how safe it is and what are its quality characteristics. That we probably have to do that in order to have you be collaborative, practice ready. And if indeed we are sending you into places where the hidden curriculum, that is what you see going on, does not match what we're teaching you. The likelihood of that being a stick or, you know, that it's sticking with you is going to be slim. And that's the work in faculty development that you're doing here at the University of Missouri. You're working with the University of Missouri as a site here to do work on faculty development uh, for that purpose. The divergence between these two leads to cynicism. It comes up in conversations with physicians, with nurses, with pharmacists, and that cynicism is hard to overcome. So it means that you going forth as students and becoming the next generation have to change the world, because if the world doesn't change, then nothing we do in education is going to matter. <coughs> The Josiah Macy Foundation sponsored this conference as well, this Aligning Interprofessional Education with Clinical Practice Redesign, and I just want to share a couple of the recommendations from that conference of last year. Um, reform the education and lifelong career development of health professionals to incorporate learning and team-based care. So what transformation and how we onboard newly graduated professionals would improve patient safety and team-based care? You all will go out into residencies. Medical students go out into residencies. Nurses more and more go out into some form of residencies. And I think we all have to be incredibly conscious about that transition to practice period. That the issues that you've been taught through IPE about systems-based care are reinforced in those new graduate experiences. Because that's a critical time. What planned interprofessional learning and leadership in QI safety and team-based competency should be required for promotion to leadership? We have not promoted to leadership in schools of nursing and schools of medicine or in hospitals or any place else based on someone's competency in team-based care and collaboration. Um, many schools of medicine and nursing struggle with bullying behaviors, disrespectful behaviors, uh, the things that are anathema to anything that would be considered good bases for teamwork and collaboration. And if indeed people don't have it affect their lives, again, it becomes less important. We have to consciously be thinking we are looking for these behaviors in the people that we promote into leadership positions. And if you don't have these behaviors, that you will not be moving forward. 
Another recommendation was to realign existing resources to establish and sustain the linkage between interprofessional education and collaborative practice. This requires thinking differently about how learners exist in a system of care. If we had a lean, highly efficient, high reliability, safe culture system into which to place learners, presumably learners would have roles in that system. They would be identifiable. This is the role of the medical student on this unit. This is the role of the nursing student on this unit. This is the role of pharmacy, chaplain, student on this unit. And they would play a role that everyone could identify and they would know what their role might be. I think we have to think a whole lot more about that on the practice side of identifying how you want students to play roles. And not just that they're guests who come in and disappear and nobody talks to them, but that you use their eyes and that you use their presence for building good communication. And if you have nursing students who are not allowed to speak to physicians, if that exists, which exists many places, then can they overhear nurses speaking to physicians so that they learn good behaviors about raising the issues they want raised and that so physicians have a way to teach through the interactions they're doing with the, with the uh, graduate nurse? What transformation in educational models would increase the likelihood of learners' exposure to high-performing teams? Every one of us in our institutions have units that are high-performing teams, and we have units that aren't, right? And do we think about that when we're placing students so that they see at least once a high-performing team, and they are actually asked to reflect upon the differences across the teams they've been placed with, and what they notice about high-performing teams versus teams that aren't high-performing. Um, at Indiana University, one of the medical faculty there has medical students reflect on that from the beginning of their clinical work. So they have to comment uh, in, in each of their rotations about what they see. At Columbia, the you know, physician there is having people write narrative experiences of that. Nursing students are being asked more and more to write. If we never ask you to reflect on the quality of teamwork and safety in a particular unit, what is the chance you're going to see it? You're not. So we have to ask you to do that. And then the whole issue of, of how we decide across the professions how long someone's in a particular place. Um, it is not uncommon for people to be in a particular team for four weeks or less. What is the likelihood that they are there long enough to develop the relationship so they understand their roles and other people's roles? And if indeed we have to keep rotating all the time, what are we saying about the issues of the quality of the system that underlies it? So just so you know, uh, those of you who are students, what faculties are dealing with in thinking about interprofessional education? Your education takes place in all these places regardless of your discipline. In the classroom, in the community, in clinical microsystems in the hospital, in simulation labs, in, and interprofessional education can and does occur in all of those places. And being conscious about how it does occur in all those places is important. In addition, you are learning to develop specific competencies, whether those are the IPEC, team-based care competencies, whether they're quality and safety competencies, but you can see around the right here a variety of things that are literally out there as competencies you should be developing, all of whom can be taught in, through interprofessional education. They can also be taught in the single discipline, but it's a mindful place you might use IPE to teach them. These, please do not read this across, read it only down, but when your faculties are deciding where to place their efforts in IPE, they, can, they have to decide what's going to be my target. Am I going to try to change leadership at the top? Because we're never going to change if we don't change the leadership at the top. Are we going to be talking about faculty development at the course and curricular level? Are we going to be talking about the students and what we do with students? Or are we going to work on this academic practice nexus? And all of those places are incredibly important targets, and somebody in your institution 
needs to be working on all of those places. You're going to be, if you're talking about the pedagogies that you could use, you have lecture, simulation, reflective journaling, case-based, asynchronous, uh, or synchronous, service learning, team-based learning. There is work to be done to develop the methods of interprofessional education in all of those pedagogies. You have sites of practice, so we're aligning education and practice, and they can be in the clinical microsystems, the simulation labs, the technologies like the IHI Open School, uh, in the community, the, the Clarion competition. I don't know if you participate in that Clarion competition, do you, in Minnesota? We have sent teams up there. Um, and then there's the competencies you want to focus on, which could be any of those that are listed on the right. So it's an incredibly complex thing on campus to figure out which targets, which pedagogies, which practice sites, which competencies you're going to focus on to, to put into professional education together for your, your particular campus. For the faculty, um, you know, they have to decide the extent of the focus on courses versus what they're going to do while they're in clinical microsystems. There are certain people that are trying to make it happen when people are in units, in a clinical practice, that they're doing something different with medical and nursing and pharmacy students while they're there working together, and others doing it in course rooms. The extent to which the focus is on IPE itself versus the other competencies. So, and IPE is just a pedagogy you're using at that particular time. And the extent of faculty development required to align IPE goals and what students are exposed to in the hidden curriculum. So maybe the, the, if the focus for faculty has to be on developing their other colleagues. On the pedagogies, I think we're having a lot of success with teaching a lot more content in interprofessional areas because there are so many things that are common. Professional ethics, QI, safety cultures, disease prevention, genetics, all those sorts of things. We can do it more efficiently and we can gain the benefit of being interprofessional at the same time. We also want to make sure that we're bringing in the patient's voice so that all of us are centered around the patient's voice in those areas and that can occur around particular diseases, particular communities of patients and whatever. And many of us are doing community-based or service learning projects. I know you have a student run Health Clinic here, we do too, and um, that's a great source for interprofessional learning. So we talked about the clinical, using the clinical microsystems to a greater extent. Um, the focus of learning there has been almost solely intra-professional. Um, we spent a lot of time in our nursing curriculum, teaching about the nursing team, but not almost nothing within the, until the last five or ten years about the team as a whole, which is all the patient cares about. Um, and then we do have licensure and accreditation requirements that reinforce an intra-professional focus. And we've been doing a lot of work in the last ten years trying to open that up and actually get requirements for interprofessional work, which we are succeeding in, I think, in all of our professions, so that's great. But I think we need to ask ourselves what we could accomplish <laughs> if, for instance, we had common orientations to a unit. Well, I mean, what if the, all the students on a particular unit had common conferences and common orientations to that unit? These are the roles people play. This is how we call the question here if we think that the process should be stopped because there's a safety issue. This is who plays what role. This is how you communicate with. This is how you call X. This is when you call X. If we all heard that same thing. If we use conferencing while people are all there to focus on these issues that are beyond a single discipline. Many of you are doing common rounds, but not in every place usually. And sometimes it's hard to negotiate the teaching of which profession is going to occur in those rounds. Involving students in common quality improvement initiatives has been a common thing. And we, at this point, have more hospitals sending us proposals for student groups to work on quality improvement than we can match up. That's the demand from the practice side that we'd love to fill with all of you learning about quality improvement while you're a part of our educational programs. 
And then, as I mentioned, these invitations to reflect on and comment and observe um, teamwork issues. I, I worked with a faculty member who had been teaching nursing students for 25 years. And uh, through the CUSID work, she reoriented her fundamentals of nursing class to include all the team-based care competencies and all the safety competencies. And then she had those same students in uh, clinical once again, and she always had. And she was just amazed at the things they were noticing that they never had noticed in her 25 years. Because, of course, she had never asked them to notice. We have this opportunity, while you're with us, to ask you to notice these things. And every faculty member who's in the room from every profession can ask students to notice it, whether or not at that moment they are in an interprofessional class. They can notice the effects of interprofessional work. Can we improve training for better collaboration? Um, and I ask these questions, when we have different meanings of teamwork and collaboration, when we have a unique meaning of collaboration in state regulatory language, when we have this culture of autonomy, when we have different labeling of the competencies across the profession. Just to give you an example, these are the names associated with um, the concept of domain you might speak from different viewpoints. So this interdisciplinary teams, team functioning, interprofessional conflict resolution, teamwork, communication. Everybody is calling it something different. And maybe we need to get now that IPEC is out. Maybe we need to rally around those uh, definitions. Um, I, I, I like to share this because I think it's important that uh, we realize that um, we do, when we come down to it, all look at it as pretty much the same. This was a study, a qualitative analysis, and asked when you experience nurse-physician collaboration at its best, what did it look like? And regardless of the view, the viewer, it looked the same. So we need to find some way of capturing that that is the same in our view and labeling it and everyone agreeing to it. They found that despite the prevailing wisdom that were qualitatively different, the stories illuminated commonalities in the collaboration experience, regardless of gender, age, experience, or profession. Um, the, this is another study that I think is interesting from the point of view of, of the recognizing that we have people who are practicing with very different views of what collaboration would look like from unconscious incompetence to, um, yeah, low-level collaboration. Things are done sort of complementary. There are smooth handoffs, et cetera, but there's, there's not really any relationship to where there's more give and take, ability to use each other's ability to problem solve, active listening, satisfaction with job well done, some appreciation of other people, and then a high level where you have this much more fluid uh, interaction. It's hard for you and your students to have this level of fluid, high-level interaction because you're, you're, you're placed for short periods of time in various microsystems. But again, if we took the, the uh, transition to practice period and we then asked you to reflect on these concepts as you saw them in other people on those teams, I think we could get at some of the elements of this higher-level collaboration. So I want to take the example of one of these competencies, because we talked about many of them that you could teach in an interprofessional way. But the challenge for your faculty is that any one of these competencies can be unpacked in incredibly complex ways. So let's take the teamwork, or teamwork and collaboration, or whatever one, and, and ask the basic question of how often we actually even work in teams. And does the level of teamwork matter? And should the IPE be focused on, uh, should the type of IPE that we do be focused uh, specific to the types of teamwork that we'll encounter in practice? Um, this is uh, from the leadership development literature from the Center for Creative Leadership, um, who uh, point out that there's a varying degrees of interdependence and collaboration as you move up these types of teams. And individuals 
um, are where one person has all the expertise, knowledge, and skills needed to do the job and is solely accountable for getting the job done. Now, the problem we have is that many professionals believe that is true, and that's how they're working, right? Um, I, I, uh, a nurse at Dartmouth once said to me, I'm the best nurse you want me caring for your mother, um, but don't bother me with collaborating with anybody else on the committee or quality improvement or anything like that. And we know physicians like that, and we know pharmacists like that. We know all of us have people like that who want to do their own job. The problem is my mother, if they just had that nurse for seven hours or eight hours, would not get good care, no matter how excellent that nurse was. The same with the physician teams. You have to have the team being able to function reliably. You have to have that unit to be able to function 24-7 reliably. And to do that, you can't just be that own person. But, so we have to get people out of the idea that this is even possible in this day and age. Work groups are groups of people who work together, who do the same kind of work, but they're not dependent on each other for information and skills. This is a common uh, faculties, uh, you know, uh, teams. More likely, and we work in, in units, in microsystems, on collaborative work groups where individuals are needed. They need information from one another. Anybody could make a mistake and it would reflect on the outcome of the whole. But still, everyone's rewarded for their individual work. That's a highly usual healthcare system. Not even a team. So their definition of a team is that where you are interdependent, you have collectively have this expertise, this knowledge, and the skills. And you have clear roles and responsibilities. You have a shared vision and a sense of purpose. You are collectively accountable for completing the task. And it's, there's some reward for the team, and it's very hard to get this when uh, cultures prize individual achievement. And then high performance teams are this unusual synergy, and people are committed to each other, regardless of who gets the credit, and they sacrifice individual rewards to, to secure the team. Um, many people think that teams should be like this, but don't have the conditions under which that could actually be actualized. So the question is, does it matter when we're teaching about teamwork and collaboration, if we help people have the context of what kind of team are they actually going to be functioning in? <coughs> so again, pushing that envelope, what if we shared a vision of the knowledge, skills, and attitudes required of all health professionals? What if we shared that? We are nowhere close to sharing that at this time. Um, there are, there's work being done all over the place to make that a common thing. But it's only now just coming out in materials that your faculties could use. And we aren't implementing it too, too often. Um, the new book, I think, by Mosser and Megan called Understanding Teamwork in Healthcare is a great new resource for us. And and, and it takes all these complexities of all this type of teamwork and collaboration into consideration, but we're not using it everywhere, And but we're going to continue to push that work. If everybody understood the relationships between healthcare errors and the quality of team communications, that we graduated, that there was no graduating health professional that didn't understand the fact that if they don't communicate well and they don't have good collaboration, if there is fear, if there is disrespect, if there is bullying, the likelihood that the patients will suffer medical error is huge. If we consistently role model the effective conflict resolution with patients and providers and members of interprofessional teams. So it means that faculties have to be part of interprofessional groups and you have to see them effectively noticing that so that medical students see their faculties treating nurses and, and others with respect and uh, seeking their in, input and guidance. Nursing faculties have to be present on units and, and parts of practice teams so that they are exemplifying those behaviors and seeking and learning and teaching about conflict resolution uh, as a part of classes. Alan Dow, who I understand has uh, taught here, or has been taught very much by, by 
and your leader here, Tina Brashears, uh, suggest that team behaviors are best taught through a sequence of learning activities, foundational instruction in the classroom, reinforcement in simulation, and then the development of proficiency through feedback and reflection in clinical settings. I mean, that's kind of where all the experiments in your Aspire uh, interprofessional unit, they have they have experiments in each of those going on. You as students can demand that there be more and you can create more, but um, you, we're trying to get to that. We at uh, UNC, we, for two years, we got all the Duke and UNC medical and nursing students together. We did a big in-class teaching about teamwork using the our, uh, work, uh, our work. And um, some people had only the big lecture. Then they went on to have case-based or high-fidelity or low-fidelity simulation. And people liked the case-based and the high-fidelity and low-fidelity sim simulation, but even people who only had the lecture changed their attitudes. So it points out that whatever we do, we're likely to have an impact. But if we can impact it at all these levels, we're likely to push, push the envelope. So that's a, the complexity around something like teamwork and collaboration. It's the same complexity in terms of number of issues. If you're talking about safety, if you're talking about ethics, if you're talking about any of those other competencies, you could be teaching using IPE as one piece of that teaching, but being reinforced in every other aspect of the teaching. Same questions about what and when to teach it, same barriers around all our schedules. The same issues about what types and levels of students across the various professions will learn best from and with each other. Again, we have experimented with medical students prior to them becoming clinical, and then nursing students have been in the clinical for two years and it didn't work very well. The medical students didn't feel good because they didn't feel like they could contribute what they should be able to. So it's this constant experimenting with what's the right levels to put together. Same opportunities to address the development of values, skills, and knowledge in clinical microsystems that are high-performing examples of interprofessional work. Same probability that students may benefit if we do anything. <coughs> you are doing some of the really important work here, which is to try to develop met metrics about what we ought to be doing and trying to develop the competency assessments for the various things that you're trying to teach here. And those we need very much because while we have these theories about interprofessional education, we don't have proof per se in, in the rich evidence-based way we would like to have over time for the difference that this could make. To collectively experiment with models for building these competencies over entire curricula is another frontier for all of us to be pushing, and then to assess whether employers of new graduates notice the desired effects. Uh, again, not for IPE per se, but as part of the Quality and Safety Education for Nurses project. The first school, one of the first schools that adopted <coughs> revising their entire curriculum to incorporate the Qs and competencies, including IPE as one method of teaching that, Within the first five years, when the dean was making rounds to the employers, uh, people were saying, what are you doing differently? We really like your graduates. We really like the product we're getting. We don't know what's different, but we really like it. That's what we want to be hearing as we push this envelope. We want to be hearing that they notice in you something different in the way you're coming to, the, to your work in the future. All right, I've made it because they made me promise there would be 15 minutes for it, and I'm very close to have just a talk with you about your issues uh, that you'd like to raise or um, interact about or share here. Um, yes, thank you. You'll uh, need to wait for a microphone right. so that you're on the... So where's the person with the question? Please 
Hi, my name is Michael Swampert, and I'm a nursing student and also a clinical uh, instructor. I'm interested in the reflective journaling to see how that's been integrated. Have you developed specific prompts? And then also, how is that sh something as personal as a journal? How is that shared with the other members of the team? And then how is it evaluated? And um, welcome to yours, too. So I, again, I, since I haven't been in a faculty role myself for quite some time, I can only report things I hear, right? So um, Tom Dewey at uh, Indiana University, who teaches the professionalism course to medical students, um, they must write uh, once a week uh, an example of professionalism that they saw while they were in the clinical situation. And then they, sh they share and read those across the room when they come together. And um, it's a, uh, having observed it, an incredibly powerful uh, reinforcement for what is to be noticed when you're actually noticing uh, examples of, of professionalism, almost all of which come out to be about teamwork, collaboration, the system, uh, professional ethics, value-based uh, decision-making, et cetera. I'm not sure it's graded. I, I'm almost certain that it isn't in that sense. Um, so, so I'm not a good source on that. The only other uh, specific example I know is this issue of uh, each uh, in a school, each clinician, each clinical teacher agreeing to ask their students at one point in the semester to reflect on instances of positive teamwork and instances of uh, where teamwork let down patients, the, the negative quality or the lack of teamwork let it down, so that over time they could share example after example after example, reinforcing the relationship between the quality of the teamwork and the care for the patient. And we have also um, invited patients, of, and I suspect Everybody does that in, in many different courses for diabetics, uh, uh, parents of children with chronic diseases, to come and talk about what they see in terms of our teamwork, as well as talking about what it's like to raise a child of that, et cetera. So, um, and then asking students to reflect on what they've heard uh, about that, how that applies to them, their future. Um, do you have examples here that you want to share? Do a journaling? Well, we do have, um, and we do encourage the third year medical students on their clinical clerkship year yeah. uh, to do some reflective writing. We give them little little pocket notebooks um, as as one of the incentives to do so. Um, and then in our humanities electives for fourth year medical students, um, there are always opportunities, regardless of the subject matter, whether it's history or religious traditions or literature, there are opportunities to reflect on the work that they've done. And we will give them prompts about, you know, your best clinical day or things like this. I think it's an interesting opportunity. Um, and we haven't done this so much yet, but really to use this as an opportunity to reflect on some of the professional work. A powerful time. I, I was. I had the privilege of uh, learning from Rita Sharon, the woman, at, the physician at Columbia, who does this. Um, and we were in a group, an audience like this, of about 90 people, physicians, nurses. We were not students, but um, and she had us write for uh, not more than 10 minutes. The prompt was something like, uh, "Think of the last time you were ill, or one of your family members was ill." What did that feel like, and what did you need from health professionals? And we, she literally, it wasn't, we did it in class, if you will, um, right then, and then she just had people stand up and read. By the time we were done, the lesson, I mean, we were, many of us in tears. Uh, I, it, it, it's so powerful to do that reflection and just do it publicly. I don't know as it needs to be graded per se, but it needs to happen and it needs to be publicly shared in some form of, so that we can learn from one another by hearing the consistency of the message. Hi, 
I'm, I'm Chris Peterson. I'm an OBGYN physician and the thread leader for interprofessional education in the medical school career. I realize that. In my yeah. spare time, I'm a student affairs team. Uh -huh. And um, so I want to thank you for a truly extraordinary presentation. This was, at the same time, incredibly grounded and amazingly both aspirational and inspirational. Mm -hmm. I'm particularly happy to see your emphasis on the workplace and what things yes. look like. If our learners yes. don't see us yes. doing what we tell them yes. to do, we might as well just keep on moving. Exactly. My question for you has to do with decisions that are made at the time of entering into any of the health and related professions. Um, you know, by virtue of my job, I do quite a bit of career counseling for medical students and for undergraduates who yes. are looking at. Yes. And, and if I may, I'd like to tell you a little story to kind of illustrate mm -hmm. where, where my question is coming from. Um, when I was a resident in Chicago, this is the late 70s, and, and yeah, some things have changed since then, but not everything. Um, uh, we were assigned for a couple of months to work at a community hospital away from Mayo Creek mm -hmm. Medical. And it was a wonderful experience. It was a terrific hospital. We were helping out in the OR in labor and delivery. And at the end of my rotation, the nurses gathered together and held a little goodbye party for me. And it was just the most wonderful, warm, we were so glad to have you here. You know, we really liked you. We wish you weren't leaving. Yep. And apparently this was the first time they had ever done it for any of the residents. Um, and I was feeling, you know, just, just wonderful about it. Yeah. Really very, very flattering yeah. and very warm and the feelings were mutual. And then they picked me up from between my scrubs and tossed me into the shower. And the feeling I had from that was, we really like you. We want you to stay here. But why did you have to go over to the dark side? Why did you become one of them and not one of us? <laughs> and there's my question. Oh, many of our students who enter yes. into medicine, nursing, yes. the other yes. professions have considered one of the other yes. professions. Yes. And is, is it not working? Okay. 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 okay, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm also yes. recovering from laryngitis. They've considered one of the other professions, sometimes very deeply and in yes. a very well informed yes. way. Other times, more um, looking at the stereotypes that you yes. alluded to, yeah. and I'm wondering if that's something that we can talk about, or maybe even is it something that we should talk about? Very good and point. Can I look at you and Very say, good point. "This is why I became a physician. This is why I yes. didn't become a nurse." Yes. You know, do we need to have that conversation before yes. we can really work together? Yes. Yes. I'm just so just being about that. Isn't that fascinating? Because instead of what we usually do is get defensive about our our identity, right? That it, as, the, as the alternative, we'll throw you in the shower. You're not one of us. Um, very very interesting point. How could we have those conversations among? Uh, could they see faculties of physicians and nurses having those conversations about how that came about, and could they then have those conversations themselves? I, I was struck by what you said last night, is that sometimes you can have a really negative conversation in the midst of that, and it would be, would be, would be hard, um, because obviously nurses and others deal with you couldn't get into medical school, and that's the reason you know, that there is that, uh, which isn't always true, <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it, that is there. And uh, very interesting. It would be fun to try that to see what difference that made. Um, it would have to be done with would, wisdom and, it would, it would have very, to be done with wisdom and, and guidance. Yes, and um, people and, and leading facilitators were very comfortable with that conversation with each other. I remember, uh, I'm old enough, of course, to have been uh, at the time of women's liberation when uh, become, being a nurse all of a sudden became a really second class thing to be. And, um, and that the first women physicians were so, uh, they, they were so insulted to be thought of as a nurse because they were fighting for their own gender uh, identity and, and power within a profession that had been dominated by men. But the re feelings that resulted from that, when in fact it, was, it wasn't anything, we were very similar and very much oriented in the same ways, exactly. But we got pushed into different things that made us feel bad. Yeah, very interesting point. Yeah. Hi, I'm Peter Bashir's nice to be all in my head. Um, Co-direct the Center for Aspire with Julie Hazlett and John Owen. And one of the questions
questions that I'm, I want to talk about because I see so many of my students here is that in my mind, I know that we have introduction to collaboration. We have, these are the skills, we give those lectures. Um, those of you who haven't completed the third year and then the fourth year don't know all of this yet, but then we have a program called Introduction to Collaboration with all of the medical students. And then we have a minimum of two interactive simulations, one high fidelity and one not. In the past, we've had four. We're working to bring back some of the others. And then we have a pain management seminar in the fourth year where everybody's working together. So to me, it feels like this very robust yeah, program. It is robust. Compared to programs Compared across to, the country, yeah, it absolutely. Is. But I bet if I went to any one of you, you'd be like, oh, that IPE thing, when was that? Yeah, yeah. Right. And is it going to be on the boards, really? Yeah. yeah. And, and what I would ask you to think about or maybe share if you know um, where this has been really successful, I agree with you completely that quality improvement and patient safety is an ideal <laughs> focus because medicine is really just catching up teaching those skills mm -hmm. at the undergraduate so is level, so is so nursing. Is nursing. Yep. So how might we start, instead of waiting for Kirkpatrick to build over four or five years yes. from <laughs> attitude, knowledge, skills, yeah. behaviors, you know, what's a way that we could start with quality improvement, patient safety training from day one that doesn't feel too abstract to a first year, but then in some way builds on itself through the whole four years and beyond in a way that makes sense. And I know that's a huge question. Well, it seems like you're doing it. You're, are you doing those uh, labs with the safety problems and right from the beginning kind of? It's mostly now at the graduate level. Though. It's at the graduate level. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so I just, you know, I'm not, it's a, it's a little bit rhetorical, but it's also an actual request with your experience with yeah. QSEN and, yeah. and things. Is, is, wouldn't that be a, a vehicle so the students don't see this as kind of, oh, that? Yes. <laughs> well, and in, uh, again, with, with the leaders who, in the pilot schools who worked on Houston at the national level, they found we, if, that we used to teach fundamentals as sort of those skills you needed to hone up before you went in, but they were the individual practice skills. And they, and a, a number of them, flipped that and said, what's fundamental? to our professions are these quality and safety competencies, you know, evidence-based practice, teamwork, and, and they started them in the beginning talking about them and then having some simulations, etc. And it seemed to change, it seemed to change the way the students grew up viewing those things in a way that it doesn't when all of our work is honed at their individual practice skills and then oh somebody tacks it on way at the end as if it was kind of a sideline uh, kind of thing. So I think that worked in those schools where the deans are hearing, oh wow, something's different about your students. I think it's that saying, this is what's fundamental to the profession. Now you're going to learn also how to be a doctor, how to be a nurse, how to be a pharmacist. But what's fundamental is that you understand quality and safety cultures, that you understand reliability, that you understand quality improvement, that you understand teamwork and collaboration, evidence-based practice. You have to understand those. That's what's fundamental. Um, I don't know. We're not there yet. You're out. Uh, we're not there yet. We're pushing the envelope, right? Yeah. So what we are, though, is at the end of our time. This is a light, and I have uh, two gifts for you. One is our Mr. Jefferson's nurse. Oh, I'm so proud of our history here. Yes. Over 110 years. And of course, everyone knows what this is. What's in here? Jefferson, Jefferson, Jefferson. Oh, I'm not Jefferson. 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 J